Hi, everyone. Happy Tuesday. Give it a couple minutes. I'm sure people are trickling back from lunch. But Donnelly, it's good to see you too. Hi, Julia. How are you? It's great being on this Zoom today. Thank you. Good to see you. Hopefully, How are you doing? We're good. We're <laughs> We're still busy. Who would have thought two years later? But oh, I know, I know. Yeah, is is the team still together? It's definitely a lot smaller. We're <laughs> a crew of five people making calls now. So I don't know. On the you... childcare team. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I see Desiree's on, so she's yeah. still there. Desiree hey, Donna. Hi. How are you? I'm good. I'm sorry you can't see me. My camera's on and it's open, but for some reason. I don't see myself unless you all can see me and I just don't know it. Nope, can't see you. Hi, Dr. Oh, Borshin, how are Hi, you? Hi, Donna. I didn't know your name was Donna Lee. I love that. Oh, thank you. How are you doing? It's so good to see you. Good to see you as well. Still plugging along, huh? <laughs> yeah, we are still the COVID unit. We've gotten a little a little more dense, densified, but we're, uh, we're still going strong. We've got and more and more procedures and uh, getting things you know, more in place, which is great internally. So we're really becoming a well-established team. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm trying to keep up. That's what we're here for. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Nicole. <laughs> Hi, Donna. How are, How are you? you? I'm good. How are you? I haven't seen you in forever. I know. It's so nice to see you. It's like old home week. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my friends. I'll give it one or two more minutes just to see if anyone else hops on, but I'll be respectful of everyone's time. And I know we have a few people that have to hop off at um, 1.30, so I want to make sure I get through my presentation and save some time for questions. Um, I know Dr. Bornstein has to hop off around 1.30, so we want to pick her brain just before she runs. And then we also have Desiree here to help out if there's any clinical questions as well. Show my screen and just get started here. Dr. Bourne, should I see your, your face? Do you see my presentation? Does I do. Up? Looks okay. great. Yep. All right, great. I don't know why you're seeing mine. You should not be seeing mine. No, I only I see your face. Like when I pull up my presentation, you're the only face. So I needed some confirmation okay. that you can yeah, see. Yeah, there we go. Okay, good, good, good. All right, perfect. So thanks again, everybody, for hopping on. Um, we just wanted to go through some updates and reminders. Um, and then, of course, use this space for any questions or feedback from you all as we're um, going through, of course, COVID still and um, navigating some of these variants. So if I can just ask to make sure everybody is muted and we'll save some questions for the end. Um, so I'm just going to quickly share the agenda. We're going to sh uh, share an update on our community levels, and then I'll go through some masking recommendations, um, stable pod recommendations, and then go through our testing resources and test to stay. Um, so hopefully everybody has been made aware that our website has been updated to reflect the CDC's COVID-19 community levels. Um, so if you go to our data tracker, which is linked on this presentation, um, here you can monitor where our counties are as far as community risk and that community level. So currently, all of Rhode Island's counties are in medium. Um, and that's based out of a low, medium, and high. So all five are in medium right now. Um, and what bumps that up is having at least 200 cases per 100,000 people. When we see that shift, we are looking at, um, you know, getting alerted around increased risk for individuals, um, monitoring the hospitalizations closer, 
Um, and the indicators are intended to predict hospital intensive care unit, bed utilization and deaths. We do see a little bit of a lag just with the data reporting um, and those shifts, but we monitor very closely so we can um, inform our partners on individual and community level preventative strategies. So with the anticipation of us being a medium right now, we just wanted to touch base on some of our recommendations for the child care um, sector. Um, and some of this is what we've been saying all along. I just want to hit home on our masking recommendations. Um, so if we do end up seeing the community level go to high, we would recommend universal masking indoors for child care um, for all eligible ages. So anyone two and older, we would encourage everybody to be masked while in high community level. Um, of course, when we're doing tests to stay and monitor to stay, the recommendation is that all participants are masking for that five day time frame. And then anyone that has had COVID-19 and completed a five-day isolation period, it is strongly recommended that they mask for the additional um, five days following that, so days six through 10. Um, and we do have a nice article here, thanks to Dr. Bornshine, that does highlight um, a person who has had COVID-19 does have a 30% chance of still being infectious on day six. So that's why it's really, really important we have anyone to an older return to care day six masking for an additional five to hopefully limit any additional spread. Um, and it's really important too for providers to outline masking policies in their sick policy so families are aware of what's expected. Of course, providers have that option to require masking day six through 10, um, otherwise telling you know, the kids they have to remain out for a 10 day isolation. Otherwise you should at least be communicating a parent's choice approach and really encouraging those parents to send their kid um, with a mask for those additional five days. Um, and as it is stated in the playbook, we are still recommending a 10 day isolation for those younger than two since they cannot mask. Um, the other piece that we have encouraged as well is an antigen test on day five of isolation just to see if um, you know, they still have live virus. So those are some of our recommendations there. And I'll pause really quickly too, if Dr. Bornchen, you had anything to add on, on this slide. You know, I, I think the only thing I would really say is, you know, I understand the concept of parents' choice, but I think what I'd really, um, if you are able to, and you you know, you feel you're comfortable enough, and you know your your parent, your family's really well, is encourage them to think about it's the parents' choice to keep the other, you know, keep all the kids not only healthy but to keep the classroom open. And I think that's really the message. It's more of a collective. We're going to take care of everybody, even though this might not be my first choice, but it's really my first choice to take care of everybody so we stay open and in person. Does that, does that make sense? Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Bornshek. Yeah. Um, and then we just wanted to put in here around stable pods. So if we do get to high community level, um, we do want to reemphasize the importance of maintaining stable groups. Um, so staff should be limiting their floating between classrooms. Um, if programs do need to utilize the float staff, we just recommend that those that are the float staff are masked at all times and are up to date with their vaccinations. Um, and I've linked the CDC's website as to what up to date means. So hopefully um, people can access that and encourage their staff to be up to date with their vaccines. We also recommend children remain in their own stable pods. So limiting that before and after school mingling, um, limit the outdoor playtime mingling, um, nap time, meal time, et cetera. Just really keeping those kids in the one pod so we don't have to see as many cases um, spreading to different groups. And then this last bullet is a great recommendation regardless of community level, um, just encouraging additional ventilation, especially as the warmer weather is approaching, we recommend open windows, a little extra time outdoors just to have that extra ventilation. And then switching gears to um, testing resources. So these are some that are outlined in the playbook already, but just wanna emphasize um, all of the options that families and providers have. So one being testing provided at the childcare program itself. Um, next would be going to their healthcare provider, their PCP or pediatrician for testing, um, utilizing respiratory clinics or urgent care centers, retail pharmacies, and of course self-test, which we're definitely seeing most of our tests being um, those self-tests. And those are available at local pharmacies or through online realtors. Um, private health insurers are also required to cover the cost of up to eight tests per month. Um, so we encourage families to check with their insurance company policy to see how they can get those reimbursed. Um, 
And then Medicaid provides coverage for self-test self kits and Medicare plans cover that as well. And then of course we still have our state run sites. They're dwindling in number, but there's still some available. So um, definitely encourage families to schedule tests of those um, through June 30th if they're symptomatic or have been in close contact. And then some other testing resources that we have. Um, Rhode Island does have places that offer free testing for those without insurance. Um, it's always important just to call the testing site to make sure um, before scheduling an appointment. Um, but there's some federal programs as well, like the Increased Community Access to Testing Program or the Test to Treat Program, which are both linked here um, and can connect folks in the community to testing sites. Um, and then another opportunity is for nonprofit child care programs, specifically in the zip codes here, the high density communities, um, to request free testing uh, resources through RIDO. Um, so that's linked here. It's just a Microsoft form. You fill it out with your information and they'll connect you to some tests. Then the last resource listed on the slide is covidtest.gov. Um, so it's, it's very easy. Dr. Bornstein had me do it the other day on a call and it took me maybe 20 seconds. Um, you just put your name and address. And then I got my tests like two days later. So it's a very quick, easy process and a nice way to get tests. So I'm gonna hop in one second. There's a dot missing in the chat. I'm gonna challenge everybody. If, has, has everybody has everybody ordered these once for themselves online? Okay, I see some yes and some no. While we're talking, you can multitask and you can you can experiment. Click on that link while we're, you're listening Scott, and feel Scott. free to see how easy it is to get them delivered to your front doorstep while we chat. Awesome. <clears throat> um, and then we also listed a couple of resources for free masks. Um, so the same partners that are giving these tests to nonprofit programs are also giving out masks. So linked there as well. And then you can find free masks um, on the CDC website linked. I did want to just, um, you know, Julia, your slides are excellent. They're really great. Um, I want to go over just quickly what that ICAT means. So ICAT, or the Increasing Community Access to Testing Program, is a federally funded program. There are about six pharmacies in Rhode Island, but there are scheduled, they're slated to be more, this is going to, we'll see more of this happening in the state, potentially, where the feds are really wanting people to be able to walk into one of these ICAT sites, get seen, get tested and get the prescription in their hands before they leave. One stop shopping is a really phenomenal opportunity for people who might have an immunocompromised condition or might not be up to date to be able to get Paxlovid uh, at one time. So it's a, I would encourage certainly, you know, anybody over 65, absolutely, you want to be thinking about getting treatment. Uh, we know 70% of our deaths from COVID are in the 65 and over crowd. Uh, and then if you look at the younger, uh, the younger ages, uh, it is people most likely who've had an underlying condition, quite often chronic cardiac conditions, uh, unfortunately being overweight or obesity is, is a, a, another major risk factor. And then the others that are uh, common as you might imagine, which would be diabetes, whether it's type one or type two. You wanna make sure people are really aware of Paxlovid being a great opportunity for people to keep them out of the hospital. So this current variant we have, this Omicron variant, it's, uh, the vaccines are very good at keeping us from getting hospitalized and getting really sick and dying. They're not so good at getting us infected. So we can get infected uh, easier with this current variant. So just wanna make sure people are super aware of that and to you know, feel emboldened to call your PCP if you're someone who would be a good candidate for Paxlovid. And don't be shy. If they say you're not a candidate, you probably are. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Bornstein. All right, and then we just wanna emphasize again, our test to state program, um, recognizing that we have that available through June 30th and that is approaching quickly. Um, so we wanna really encourage programs to utilize that resource while we have it. Um, of course, that's the recommended quarantine approach when the community level's high. So we're not there just yet. If we were to switch to high community level, um, we would just want programs to be proactive have those test to state consent forms already fill, filled out um, so that if you need to um, implement it, it's a pretty easy process. Um, so I've linked those forms here. They're on the DHS website under handbooks and forms. I've heard that there's some issues with the link in the playbook, so I'll work on fixing that, but just know that those resources are on the website. So if, if you can't get it through the playbook, just go to the DHS site. Um, and then the link for 
requesting test to stay supplies is also linked here as well. Um, so really, really want to encourage programs to get testing supplies um, while you can through this resource. Um, and then I did want to highlight one FAQ that we have been receiving around PCR tests um, and programs still requiring a PCR um, for their staff or children to return to child care if, for instance, they were in close contact or someone in the house was positive. Um, we just wanted to make sure programs feel comfortable accepting those rapid antigen tests. Um, we know that those are sufficient as options for staff and children to use in order to return. Um, and they have you know, a quick turnaround, easy to access. Um, so we just wanna make sure people know that there's some flexibility there. And Dr. Bornstein's the pro at um, <laughs> describing the differences in those test types. So if you have anything to add there, I just wanted to make that a point um, that programs don't need to be relying on um, PCR tests. Yeah. Great. I'm so glad that you brought that up, Julie. I think that's, you know, I think early on when, um, you know, COVID was new and we didn't know how good our tests were going to be. And, you know, we had a lot of concerns about um, transmission because we didn't, frankly, we had no vaccines, we had no treatments and, you know, people were dying. The good news is, you know, it's, uh, COVID's now treatable and preventable. Vaccines, uh, Paxlovid, monoclonal antibodies, um, and of course, these fabulous devices, which are super helpful. Um, and so one of the things we can tell you is that antigen tests have come a long way since two years ago, two plus years ago when we began. And antigen tests are really, really, really quite good at detecting symptomatic disease. So when you have a, a you know a viral load that's uh, it's not even viral, when you have enough concentrated uh, COVID uh, or SARS-CoV-2 virus, you're going to get a positive. This is a negative, a positive on your on an antigen test, ninety over ninety percent of the time. So if you've got symptoms, your antigen tests are really really quite sensitive. In fact, they're the same tests that you get when you go to your doctor for the flu swab or a rapid strep swab, those are antigen tests. And we make lots and lots of clinical decisions based on those rapid, uh, those are antigen tests. Now that's not to say that PCR tests are done for good. That's not true. We will still use PCR tests in nursing homes and emergency rooms. Um, so that's how we keep a line of sight on those variants. We won't, you know, you can't know what the genomic sequence is from an antigen test. So you have to have a swab that gets looked at. So all our emergency rooms in Rhode Island and some of our, um, we call COVID surveillance sites. Those are places we'll still do PCRs to look. So it's not that you shouldn't ever use a PCR again, but you really don't need to rely on them. Let's say you're asymptomatic, you're a close contact. You know you can repeat these antigen tests uh, 48 hours later, you can do them serially, and that makes the, uh, the sensitivity of it, makes the positive predictive value better. So think about that if um, you know, PCR tests are gonna be in increasingly more and more difficult for you to find. Um, ICAT sites, some of them, that, that's the increasing uh, community access to testing. Some of them still have PCRs, but you can feel fairly comfortable um, either using serial antigen tests or um, you can go into the pediatrician's office or use one of the other sites. Um, and again, um, I would uh, tell you that in the fall, if we see any kind of different variant and we have any concerns about we have any concerns about uh, antigen tests uh, being less sensitive, we would certainly share it at that time. Thank you. Then my last slide, as always, is um, emphasizing the importance of reporting your cases still to RIDO, including those self-tests. Um, so we are providing follow-up guidance recommendations on self-tests. Um, and we do need to have those reported to us via our email or they can be called in. Um, the other thing is reporting self-tests through RIDO's portal. Um, so really hitting the message to families that if they have a child or if it's a staff, um, having themselves enter that self-test result into our portal, which is um, extremely valuable for us to track and monitor outbreaks and respond accordingly. So I've linked that portal here again. Um, I'll work on a uh, um, letter that providers can give to families to help with the Entering, entering those self-tests, um, but really just want to emphasize that message as well. Um, and then of course, right now our volume is pretty high. I'm sure some people may be waiting on a response from us. We have lots of you reaching out, which is wonderful and wanting our support. And we're trying to get to you as fast as we can, but just want to emphasize relying on our playbook for support in the meantime, if you are waiting for um, a call back from us. 
Um, slide 36 highlights our recommendations based on the community level. Um, so it breaks it down as an overview and then the slides following um, break it down even further. Um, but while you're waiting for us, you know, we hopefully have given you the tools in that playbook to make the best decision for your program in the meantime. Another helpful thing too, is if you're reporting a case to our email, if you can outline these bits of information, it helps our follow-up process a little quicker. Um, so if you can just outline it in email, um, I'm sure people as they're sending it to the COVID email account, you're getting that automatic reply with a template and people have been responding with the information that's been very helpful. So if you can continue to do that, um, we can get to you quicker. So that's, that's all I have. Um, I don't know if Desiree or Dr. Bornshine, anyone else wants to just jump in and add anything before I open it up for questions. I think you have some chat questions, Julia. Okay, let me stop sharing my screen here. I was just gonna bring those up. Um, one question came from Emily Hamill. Why do we have parents sign a consent form to get the testing resources for test to stay? And I think that there's, you know, the obvious reason of we want to see how many tests the center needs and how many parents would be willing to do test to stay. But what are the other, you know, logistics behind that? I'm trying to see the question. So why do we have parents sign a form to get the resources for test to stay? Um, so you can you can order the supplies with an estimate of how many children will be. Um, participating in test to stay, but we just want to make sure that parents are consenting to opt into test to stay before implementing it. So if there's a family who doesn't want their child tested daily for five days or something of that nature, you're aware that they haven't consented to that and they might need to follow um, an alternative option such as staying home for five days or whatnot. So it's not necessarily required on our end to see all of the consent forms. Um, we just want to make sure programs are being um, proactive, have that already filled, filled out just in case you do need to implement it at some point. I don't know if that answers the question, but. Um, and then the next question in the chat, it's from Deb McBride. She asked if a parent tests positive and the child has been vaccinated since December, would the child be exempt from daily antigen tests and able to attend childcare? Um, I feel like this encompasses a couple of things because we're talking about an exposure in the household. So household exposure, it's 10 days if they have ongoing exposure to the positive case, but then it would be recommended five days if they're unvaccinated um, and they have a last date of exposure, but they're separated. Because this child is fully vaccinated, you can allow them to attend childcare. They would be exempt from quarantine as long as they're up to date on their vaccine. Um, and testing would still be recommended on their day five from last exposure. Is there any questions about that? Okay. And now I'm just scrolling down to see a few more questions. Um, Nicole asked, are we seeing that rapid tests are more reliable now? We were seeing that they were not as reliable for a few months with the Omicron variant and with many schools reporting false negatives. I think that we did go over that, but <clears throat> I think what Dr. Bornstein was mentioning is that PCR testing is going to be becoming less and less available as the pandemic goes on and we're ending you know, we're moving on, um, but the rapid tests and the home tests have been reliable. Um, if you have any instance where you're unsure of a certain scenario, you can definitely follow up with our team. If you have a student that has ongoing symptoms and they're producing negative results, um, or if you receive a positive antigen or a home test and you are following up with us, we can provide guidance on that scenario. Does that answer that, Nicole? And then Khadija asked, are most places who do test to stay having the parents do it at home before they come? Um, so to my knowledge, how test to stay works is um, following a positive case exposure in a classroom that has individuals that are older than two years and you're implementing test to stay, you would send families home with enough tests um, for the parents to swab their child at home prior to attending for um, 
upwards to five days because it would be done five days following the last date of exposure. So for example, if you find out that a positive case exposure occurred today in childcare, then you would send parents home with three tests because there's three tests left in this week. We have Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And then the weekend dates would be the remaining two days of a five-day mitigation period. So you would send the parents home with three tests. They would swab their child at home prior to bringing them into care. And then they would attest that they're negative. And how you track that, that's up to you. Um, some providers will have parents take a picture of the test, the negative test, and send it to the provider um, for them just to attest that they tested negative. Does that make sense for the test to stay? There is an example um, test tracker too on the website. I just put it in the chat. So it's on DHS's website. Um, if you click the link and then scroll down, you'll see handbook and forms. If you click under there, you'll see the test to stay. Um, so there's an example, just test tracker again to Desiree's point. Some people just send a picture of the test results to the provider. Others will track it on that um, test tracker, whatever is most useful for your center. Um, and we have recommended that the parents do the swab prior to bringing the child to care, just so we're not, providers aren't wrangling, you know, 10 kids running around waiting on test results. We would want all of the kids to stay apart while they wait on those results. Um, so it's best <clears throat> to have the parents swab them prior to bringing them to school. Um, Jennifer asked a great question. She said the test to stay kits are approved through June, but what's the plan after June for child care providers to obtain tests for test to stay? So there are a few options listed in the plate or um, in this presentation. And then um, DHS is also working on some opportunities as well. So feel free to reach out. Nicole is on too. I don't know if Nicole, you want to speak to that. No, I really, I mean, Julia said it, we're looking at um, figuring out how we can get some more after June. So stay tuned. We will definitely have some answers for you. We just don't have them yet. Thanks, Nicole. Yeah, and again, for tests to stay, that's really only when the community level's high. So if um, if you're implementing it through, you know, if it's low or medium community level, we would say it's up to the providers to secure the tests um, for that. But once in high, strongly encourage um, leveraging some of those free community resources, um, the federal resources. And then um, once DHS can work out some of those opportunities, um, leverage those as well. Yeah, question about test kits. Yes, yeah, so <clears throat> Callie, I think she's referring to the scenario that I just stated. So why would we only give three test kits if we were asking them to test for five days? If we give them three, then on Monday, they have possibly gone two days without testing. So the recommendation would still be for them to test on day five. The recommendation will always be test on day five after last date of exposure. But when they're implementing test to stay, it's for them to test prior to attending childcare. So in this scenario, we have three days left of the week after today. And if today was the last date of exposure, they would test for three days in this week. And then we would obviously advise them to go and obtain a test on Sunday. If you want to provide that test to them, you certainly can. Um, but you can, you know, just say, I want you to have a negative test on this Sunday, which would be day five to return on Monday, but you do not have to provide them with that test. Does it, I think that answers that question. Okay. Um, so that's, those were the questions in the chat. If anybody has any other questions, they can unmute or I can keep an eye out on the chat. I know there's been a few questions about the rapid test. Um, in the playbook, it still says there should be a confirmatory PCR um, on one of the pages. Um, to, are you saying that it should be fine to accept the rapid as is? Yeah, um, and that's, without a that's, confirmatory. Okay. That will be updated too. That's one of the edits to the playbook I'm working on. Um, okay. That it's now. Awesome. So um, typically try to do the child care playbook in alignment with the K 12 1 2. So both teams are working on that. Um, but that's one of the, the updates taken on by PCRPs. And is there then. An release date for the new playbook? 
You're muted, Julia. Thanks, Desiree. I don't have a set date. I'm hoping in the next week or two. It's it's always hard for me to set a date because there's a lot of little logistical pieces that come into play with it. But um, hopefully, you know, before June, we'll have that updated. I have a question about masks. Um, I know that masks are not mandated anymore, but we've been wear still having the adults wear masks, so we're we're going to lift that. Um, do we, you guys have any recommendations about that? And what if you have staff who are not um, vaccinated? We have a couple. Does that matter, or it's just you know can be anyone can go mask free? So that's a great question. Julia, I'm back. I apologize. My Teams was, uh, I mean, my Zoom link uh, crashed for some reason, which happens, as we all know. So um, I think that's that's a really great uh, point that you're bringing up. And I'm um, grateful to you because one of the things we want to start thinking about is where are we right now in the pandemic? Um, you know, it is a preventable, treatable illness. Um, if you're not vaccinated, either because you couldn't get vaccinated or chosen not to, um, we know that those who are not up to date are going to be more at increased risk for um, developing severe disease, uh, needing to get hospitalized, et cetera. So we wanna be thinking about where we are right now. And I wanna be really honest about where we are because I think this is what informs these kinds of decisions. And so what I'd like to do, if it's okay with your permission, is I wanna take you to, um, to see a screen that is right on our website. Um, I don't know if you're able to let me share, Julie, or not, but I think it's reasonable for us to show this. Um, okay, so I'm just going to show you where we are. I know we're we're all uh, probably got another meeting coming up, but that's not quite quite what I wanted. But that's okay. We're going to go to this, and let's see if I can. Can you see where it says Rhode Island Department of Health COVID-19 data tracker? Yes. Good. I'm glad. So I want to show you where we are. This is where we are. We're currently at this high. Uh, gray bar on May the 14th. This is the hospital admissions. So you can see where we're going since March the 26th. We're on an upward trend. And you can also see the cases per 100,000. So the increase in cases that you're seeing in your child cares are what's driving the two to three week lag in hospital admissions. So the more people that you can have uh, that are not exposed, i.e. by wearing a mask, the more people you'll be able to keep out of the emergency room. It's those people who are vaccinated and up to date are the less likely to be hospitalized. That's, you know, that's something to bear in mind is those people are at much higher risk. And you, you, know, you wanna be thinking about who can we help keep out of the hospital? Anybody with an underlying immunocompromised condition or someone who's not vaccinated or up to date. So this is just a, an idea of where we are. And we're gonna, you know, we're still going up. We're not gonna be anything like that January spike where we actually had to have the federal government come and help us in our hospitals. We had no, we had such our staffing was really problematic. And the thing to think about is if you know if somebody has chest pain or slurred speech, you no know, heart attack or stroke, they're gonna be waiting in the ER longer than they would be whether we if whether if we were here, right? Does that make sense? So we wanna be thinking about protecting people and that should help inform your decision about what you wanna make for a policy. I don't know if that's helpful and if I can explain that better, let me know. Any other questions? If parents choose not to do the test to stay, so we have them sign the forms ahead of time, but if they choose not to do the test to stay, then they should be aware that they are required to quarantine as normal for the five days or, okay. And then any class, younger than two is required to do the 10 or the seven day quarantine at so a minimum? Anybody under the age of two, our recommendation is a five day quarantine um, test on day five. Okay, um, to return on day six. Exactly, so okay. that would be our recommendation um, okay. for those. And then of course, if we're in low community level, we say it's acceptable for the younger than two to participate in monitor stay. So where we are right now, we would say younger than two 
um, should do a five day quarantine and then anyone over to um, can still participate and monitor to stay. We're seeing a good amount of programs doing tests to stay right now, or kind of a, I guess, a very vari a variation of both. Um, so testing on a couple of the days, but still remaining in care doing monitor to stay. So um, I like to see the, the flexibility in those options. Nothing is like a set requirement anymore for quarantine. Um, so whatever works best for your program. Um, Diane, where's Diane's question? Diane asked a question about receiving a negative antigen test on day seven, but a positive PCR on day eight. And she asked if that's common. I think that what Diane's asking is this is after already receiving a positive result. So we're already testing positive and then retesting again on day seven and day eight. So it is common to see a negative antigen test anywhere after day five of your own isolation, whereas the PCR, that can still result positive for up to 90 days, up to three months. Um, and then Heather had asked, I thought this was recommended, not required. Can we clarify? Julia, I was kind of in the chat, so I'm not sure if that pertains to what you were just discussing, um, but the playbook, the playbook serves as recommendations. Isolation, yeah, isolation is the only thing that is still a requirement. required. Quarantine is um, all of that is a recommendation. Okay, and then um, April Young, who tests the under two since ours are not approved? Is it state sites and pediatricians? Um, yes, yeah, so you can send them to state sites and their pediatricians um, if you are doing the test to stay at your center. Um, and then. Diane Nelson, no, all antigen tests were negative prior. We can take that one offline um, just because I don't want to, you know, get into any of your personal cases on this platform, um, but we can definitely connect on this offline. I'll, I'll give you a call or send you an email. Um, and then Laura Peary, can we accept rapid antigen tests for those under the age of two? I so wish there, Dr. Bornstein was on still, yeah, but so, there are some antigen tests that are still approved for the under those under the age of two. And if you're sending them to their pediatrician, if you're sending them to the state run testing sites, that would be acceptable. Yeah. So the self, the self tests that were, for example, supplying for tests to stay aren't approved for the under two. So that's why we don't recommend tests to stay, but if they're, they're going to their pediatrician um, or a testing site, and are getting swabbed by a professional, um, those antigens are acceptable. Any other questions or feedback? Anybody wanna share how things are going for their facility? Hopefully some people have been able to have some success with tests to stay or monitor to stay. I'm not sure if anyone wants to just jump on. If not too, we can always give people back some time to their afternoon, so. Well, thanks as always for hopping on. If there are any questions that come about after the end of this, feel free to reach out to our email and we'll get back to you. Um, this was recorded too, so we'll get the link set out. Um, we'll get the FAQs put together as well. Um, and as always, just really appreciate everybody um, continuing to work with us and um, you know stay on top of this and protect your facilities and your families. Um, so thank you. And hope everybody has a wonderful afternoon. Bye everyone. Bye everyone. Thank you.